Hello, uh, my name is uh, Rich Rotuno. I'm the MCUBE uh, seminar coordinator and welcome to the MCUBE weekly seminar. Today, we're very happy to have uh, Professor Laura Zana. She's a professor of mathematics and, and uh, atmosphere ocean science at the Quran Institute, New York University. Her research focuses on dynamics of the climate system with emphasis on the influence of the ocean. Professor Zana obtained her PhD in 2009 in climate dynamics from Harvard University. Until 2019, she was a faculty member at the University of Oxford. In 2020, she received the Nicholas P. Fafanoff Award from the American Meteorological Society for, quote, exceptional creativity in the development and application of new concepts in ocean and climate dynamics. And we're really fortunate to have her here to talk, tell us about machine lear learning for mesoscale closures and ocean models. Professor Zana. Great, thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction. I'm very excited to be here. Of course, uh, sad to not be in person uh, as always. Um, there's, uh, you know, we are used to the world uh, on Zoom uh, during COVID, but never quite the same. So still hope that you'll get something out of this talk. So what I'm gonna to try to do is, so first remove all the little panels. Uh, and then uh, stop talking. There we are. Okay, good. So I'm um, going to talk about some work that we've been doing in the last few years on uh, using machine learning um, to improve uh, closures in ocean models. And so what I'm going to do today is a little bit of an overview of the type of methods we've been using. And every time, really, what I'm going to do is tell you the pros and cons. So it's not gonna be about machine learning can solve everything or everything works, but it's gonna be a little bit of what works, what doesn't and where we should make progress. And, and also where we took a little bit of a step back, but also how we're trying to move forward in using those methods. So as always, I'm here, I'm the one presenting, but most of the work uh, comes in collaboration with uh, a lot of uh, great people, students and postdoc, uh, you know, past and present, Andrew Ross, Ziwei Lee, Pavel Perez, Hogan, uh, Archer Guillaume, and Tom Bolt. So I'm a large scale climate dynamicist. That's usually what motivates all my work. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a, a plot coming out of CMIP6 um, of dynamic sea level. So here, what we see is basically the ensemble mean of dynamic sea level uh, under 1% CO2 in a suite of CMIP6 model. And so the pattern that you see, of course, is, you know, non-uniform, meaning that we know that global mean sea level is gonna go up but it does not go up uniformly. And there is a big imprint of ocean dynamics and ocean circulation on the regional patterns of sea level. And this is what we see in this plot here. And this map um, is actually pretty well understood to first order. The dipole that we see in sea level change in the Southern Ocean is mostly due to Ekman transport. So changes in ocean circulation in the Southern Ocean that tries to really kind of, you know, change uh, the circulation over here. The North Atlantic will also understand as a change in circulation. So I understand the pattern pretty well. But now if we look at the spread in CMIP6 model, so here what we see is, of course, the spread can be actually as large uh, as the signal. And it's usually located in regions where the signal is rather large as well. So overall, we have you know, pretty big signature of ocean circulation when we look at dynamic sea level, but we also have a pretty large spread and that spread is actually coming from different models which have different structure. So of course you could ask the question, well, it is possible that it comes from the coupling or that it comes from you know, the ocean dynamics or the parameterization. So what we've done is we took a set of simulations and we apply exactly the same forcing to all those CMIP6 type models. And what we show is actually it really comes from the parameterization in the ocean component of the model. So I'm not gonna explain you know, every single part of ocean parameterization, but just to give you a little bit of a flavor here, we're looking at heat content, which will basically be how much the uh, ocean is warming in the Southern Ocean. And all the different dots um, are basically different uh, components on the right-hand side of the heat content uh, equation. And we can just look at one of them. So say the isopycnol mixing, which is gonna be uh, mixing along isopycnols in the Southern Ocean. And that's 100% parameterized in a, in a climate model. And the dots are a little bit all over the place, depending on the model that you pick. And it will be the same for pretty much every parameterization in the ocean. They will result in a large spread uh, in ocean heat content and in dynamic sea level, even though you might have exactly the same surface force. So really processes that are not resolved in climate model are one of the main sources of uncertainty and spread when we look at climate projections. 
And so how have we been dealing with parameterization and closure, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell this audience, but usually to actually, you know, come up with projections or at least simulation of climate, what we do is we have equations and we discretize them. And so we have to solve them on the grid and everything that is happening below the grid box size of the climate model that you have has to be parameterized, right? So here I'm writing down the momentum equation, right? And the bars, let's assume is the grid box of your climate model. And we're gonna have basically an additional term here. In this case, it's gonna be say ocean mixing. So all the scales that we can parameterize in the ocean for you in the atmosphere, because I know most of the crowd is, is an atmospheric crowd, could be clouds, could be turbulence in the boundary layer and so on and so forth. All the things you can't resolve that are too small to be resolved by the grid of the model or for which you don't even have an equation sometimes. So here, of course, I'm gonna focus on the ocean. And usually what we do for parameterization is we come up with a closed form of equation that only depends on the result scale with a few parameters that we need to determine. And then as I showed you, even though parameterization have done a great job, right? They really are improving climate models. They still are a source of uncertainty. So they still struggle to improve climate models and projections, even though we might increase the complexity of the model. We still have a bit of a struggle with this kind of, you know, basic approach of trying to come up with a mathematical expression that will just try to mimic all the impact of scales that we don't resolve on the large scale flow. So our idea with machine learning was, can we leverage the amount of data that we have? And it's mostly gonna come from simulation with advanced tools from machine learning, which are exceptionally good at extracting information from the data to come up with new parameterization for processes that are not resolved in climate model. And so, you know, this is not our idea. I came out, you know, for you know, more than a decade already. So going back to Graham and Polsky, really looking at radiation, for example, using machine learning to emulate radiation. And since then, especially in terms of atmospheric processes, there's been a lot of papers out there, whether it's deep convection, warm rain processes from you know, some colleagues uh, at NCAR, uh, David John Gagne and, and Andrew Gentleman, and so on and so forth. So a lot of, you know, basically steer around using data and machine learning to try to come up with new parameterizations for atmospheric processes. And we've done a little bit of the same, but on the ocean side. So can we use data to learn new parameterization for ocean mesoscale closures? So again, uh, some papers are now com coming out and there is one also with colleagues again at NCAR on the ocean uh, side, trying to uh, um, use also high resolution data coming out of, uh, of the CESM model to improve parameterizations in the ocean. So a lot of uh, you know, excitement around the idea of machine learning because they're quite powerful as long as you have good data. But of course, you know, would they do better than existing parameterization and would they really improve climate model? It's a big question, right? And that's really something that we're trying to address or I could say play with uh, and entertain the idea and try to explore. So let me try to motivate a little bit more. Why do we look at the oceans and mesoscale eddies in particular? So, you know, mesoscale for us in the oceans is a little bit different than mesoscale in the atmosphere. Because again, usually we don't resolve them in the current generation of climate model. So here um, we can see surface velocities from uh, the same model, but run at three different, three different resolution. One degree, quarter of a degree, one twelfth of a degree. And so, of course, as you increase resolution, so you have basically smaller and smaller grid box sizes. And so, without stating the obvious, we have more turbulence, we have more filaments being created. Basically, the turbulence is being better resolved. Now, of course, it's not just that we have prettier pictures, it's also that we resolve the large scale currents and the mixing um, you know, more accurately than before. And, and that's quite important, right? Now, of course, we can't really afford to run coupled climate model and large ensemble for hundreds of years, you know, at this resolution. So usually we're stuck either in a resolution that is relatively cool, so even that can permit some eddies, but nonetheless does not resolve them for free. So those scale, those mesoscale eddies that you can see here detaching from the Gulf Stream, for example, or uh, around the, the Southern Ocean, they basically have scale of 10 to 100 kilometer, right? So they basically, you know, where rotation becomes important and stratification is important. So again, quite small scale compared to the mesoscale in the atmosphere. And as I said, they're quite important for heat uptake, pressure transport, and I showed you a few pictures of that before. Another aspect that might be also more familiar for you in the atmosphere is that, 
what they do, the, what the mesoscale are doing is also basically transferring energy from the small scale into the larger scale. So they basically mimic backscatter, right? And so, so that's, you know, true in, uh, you know, 2D quasi uh, geostrophy. And so here's a plot to show you this. So we're looking at a flux of energy as a function of wave number in a portion of the Southern Ocean in this kind of high resolution or in this kind of global simulation at three different resolutions that I showed you before. So if we concentrate on the, on the continuous line, the thick lines, so we have three resolution, right? So let's start with the green one, which is the highest resolution. So we have a lobe of negative flux at small scale, and then a lobe of positive flux at large scale. And so what we're seeing is we're extracting energy, kinetic energy from the small scale and backscattering it to the larger scale. So we really have this kind of transfer of energy from small to large scale. If we have a model that is coarser, so now we're going from green to red. So if, I, if we have the same model, but run at 30 kilometer resolution. So now of course we can see that the negative lobe is smaller and the positive lobe is also smaller. So the effect of backscatter is actually reduced uh, because of the coarser resolution. If you go to a one degree model, then obviously there's no more transfer at all because we're not even permitting some of those eddies. So they, it's completely inexistent. There is no more you know, energy being transferred from the small scale to the large scale. And you can understand the consequences of that, right? So basically we dissipate more at small scale, but that doesn't mean we're gonna transfer that energy or that flow back into the larger scale. So we're gonna affect the ocean currents. And again, we're gonna affect the ocean stratification and the way we mix and steer tracers of all. And so that's you know, one of the symptoms, if you wish, of not resolving mesoscale eddies in ocean models. We inhibit backscatter, we inhibit this kind of you know, uh, upscale energy transfer and affecting uh, large scale tracers, uh, mixing and transport overall. So what I'm gonna do now is trying to show you a little bit how one would go about and come up with a parameterization for those mesoscale eddies. So again, all those scales that, you know, affect the large scale fluid, but that we can't resolve that coarser resolution. And how do we do that from data rather than just making an assumption of what the mathematical form of the operator should be? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take high resolution data and it's gonna be simulated data. We, we're not gonna use observations at all here. So we're gonna, talk, we're gonna take simulated data and we're gonna focus on the momentum flux, all right? So, we're only gonna look at parameterization of the eddy momentum fluxes. So let's start with our basic equation of motion. Of course, I hid in a lot of terms here just to make it cleaner and simpler. So the UDT, so momentum equation, local rate of change of U plus advection, which is what causes the trouble, right? So it's not highly nonlinear. So obviously, you know, mesoscale eddies will, will definitely be influenced and, and influencing this term at different resolution forcing and dissipation. So if I take the high resolution simulation and filter it to coarse grain it, right? So I take this, this equation and filter it to coarse grain it, what I end up with is something like look like this, if I were in a perfect coarse resolution model with an S term, which is the parameterization of the closure that I'm looking for, which gonna be the difference between the coarse resolution advection and the filtered high resolution advection. So what I resolve on the, you know, on the fine scale, but filtered minus or you know one minus that, whatever I can really resolve at the resolution of the coarse resolution model that I have. And so this residual will be the effect of the mesoscale eddies on the coarse resolution flow. So if I had a perfect model, if I had a perfect coarse resolution model, I'll try to come up with an S here that does not depend on the fine resolution flow. And so that's kind of the crux of the whole parameterization business is to come up with an S that knows nothing about the fine scale and only knows something about the high resolution uh, of the coarse resolution model. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, again, use high resolution data. We're gonna do this kind of you know, mechanism of taking high resolution, filtering it, coarse graining it, diagnosing this S term that we are really trying to learn to make our coarse resolution model perfect, if you wish. And then we're gonna learn uh, this S using machine learning, all right? So we're gonna use two different types of, of machine learning algorithm. One is kind of neural network, a little bit black box, if you wish, basically throw a lot of data to the algorithm, and then they'll learn uh, an 
adequate representation of the data of S, of this sub subgrid closure that we're looking for. And of course, usually they're extremely powerful, the more data and the more good data you have, but they can be pretty opaque, meaning they can come up with thousands of parameters that are pretty hard to interpret. Second method I'm gonna show you is a method that is a bit more interpretable. So here, rather than throwing all the data into a very big black box with you know, thousands of parameters, we're gonna try to learn an equation for the parameterization. I'm gonna try to learn a symbolic representation um, of this missing Eddy Falls. And finally, what we're gonna do is after we learn those closures, uh, we're gonna go and try to implement them in an idealized model. And so that's gonna be a little bit of the outline for the next you know, 30 plus minutes or so. Now in those two methods, what I'm gonna show you as well is there are a lot of things that work, but a lot of things that don't work. And so hopefully I'll have time to show you a few more slides of you know, some recent work in which we are really kind of trying to take a step back and come up with a test bed um, to you know, rethink the way we're actually designing the problem and how sensitive um, you know, the methodology that we're using uh, is to learning subgrid parameterization because at the end of the day, we want to implement them in a range of climate models. So we really need to make sure that whatever we learn is robust, um, you know, is scale aware, flow aware, and it's something that is learning physics rather than just fitting a bunch of you know, parameters to a lot of data and, and might not be very robust in a different climate regime, for example, which is really kind of the, the core here. So let me start with a couple of examples. So I should mention a little bit of a warning. Um, as I said at the beginning, I'm a large scale climate dynamicist. So the talk is not really gonna be about the machine learning you know, techniques, so to speak. I'm, I'm really gonna go rather fast through them, but mostly telling you about the power or the challenges associated with them. So I'll uh, give you a little bit of a warning on that. So let's start with one experiment that we've made. And again, we're gonna take you know, data from high resolution and we're going to use convolutional neural networks. So what are they? So they're basically neural networks that are going to learn filters, um, you know, as you basically process through the data that will basically best match uh, the data that you give it to learn a subgrid parameterization. And to do that, we need to define a loss function. That means that the algorithm will need to actually, you know, optimize or, or minimize this loss function so that the prediction of the subgrid parameterization that it comes up with matches best the one that we've diagnosed, all right? So we're basically trying to learn the maps of subgrid forcing, only knowing course resolution velocities in this case, uh, through this machine learning algorithm, which is basically a convolutional neural network. So at the end of the day, we should come up with a lot of weights, multiplying, if you wish, kind of, you know, symbolically, the velocity, the course resolution velocity, and that means you would need nothing. You would need to know nothing about a high resolution uh, run at the end of the day, but you still need to use the data to learn it. So one experiment that we've done is we took um, data from a coupled climate model uh, run at one tenth of a degree. So it's the GFD LCM 2.6. The model is actually a little bit old to some extent, but it's still extremely powerful. So it's fully coupled. Uh, but we only use data from the ocean. And so what we've done is we only took four different regions of the ocean. Uh, we diagnosed this missing subgrid forcing, and this is, for example, a map of it here. So you can see it's pretty small scale, right? It's pretty noisy uh, at the end of the day. And you can think about it, right? It's really kind of a lot of momentum fluxes um, at a given time that's trying that are basically a reflection of how the eddies are you know, mixing and steering and how they're gonna affect the large scale momentum. So it's, it's quite patchy, uh, so to speak. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this data set, right? So again, it's, it's a model data set. So it just, uh, you know, well, I think it's important to repeat it. It's still not the truth, but this is as good as we've got. We filter it, coarse grain it, and then given a, a surface velocity, we asked the neural network to learn the best representation of that subgrade momentum flux. But rather than learn um, basically a given value at a given grade box, we asked it to learn a probability. We asked it to learn a Gaussian probability. So we made an assumption, obviously, that the conditional probability of the eddy flux on the course resolution velocity is Gaussian, which is not true, by the way, but it's pretty good first approximation. And so the last function that, that we wrote uh, is basically a negative log likelihood to learn the mean 
and the standard deviation of that Gaussian PDF at every grid point. So again, at every grid point, the neural net is gonna output the mean value of this PDF that best represents the subgrid pulsing, but also a standard deviation associated with it. So again, because the mapping at the end of the day of this nonlinear function is very you know, unlikely to, to be deterministic. So that's a way to actually learn a stochastic parameterization with neural network directly you know, within the loss function. So what are we doing well? Well, we only learn on four region, right? So we took data from four region in the ocean. So let me go back for a second, right? So four region in these data sets. And then we're trying to learn the subway forcing over the entire domain. Now we only learn on PI control. So meaning that the CO2 level was 280 ppm. And so here we're looking up here at the L squared. So all we're talking about here, you know, without going into specific definition is how skillful the parameterization that we learn is over the entire domain. Um, and so basically, sorry, I cut off the bottom of that plot, but it goes between 50% scale and 100% scale, right? So even the worst region, we still do 50% well, if you wish. And the worst regions, and let's start with the worst because it's important. The worst regions are the ones that are covered with ice in general. And it's not hugely surprising that we do really poorly is because we only gave the neural network data that comes from regions that are ice free. We only give it regions in the Gulf Stream, you know, in the equator or, you know, kind of, you know, southern part of the subtropics where they had different flow regimes that different dynamics, different Reynolds number, if you wish, but they've never seen anything that is related to ice interaction or probably strong LC coupling. And so if you don't give the right data, then obviously you do poorly. But nonetheless, we were still surprised that with only a few regions in the majority of cases, you know, we actually can get 70% scale in reproducing the subgrid momentum flux. So quite limited amount of data with the caveat that we, don't, we do extremely poorly at high latitude. Now, if you learn, if you take this learn parameterization, right? So we learn on PI control, so pre-industrial control one, and we actually try to see with that parameterization, you know, work in principle in a model uh, in which the CO2 is double, right? So now we're not gonna retrain the weights. We're not gonna retune the parameterization. We're not gonna do anything, right? It's not even implemented right now. It's only offline. So we're gonna take the data from a, you know, 1% CO2 experiment. We're gonna diagnose the subgrid forcing. And then we're gonna test if our new parameterization matches the subgrid forcing from this, you know, double CO2 experiment. And so that's the scale that you see down here. Basically, they're indistinguishable, right? So, and even though, you know, we know for a fact, because we diagnosed that, I'm not showing that here, but we know for a fact that both the velocities and the subgrade forcing are changing by, you know, 40 to 50%, yet we do really well at, you know, reproducing the subgrade forcing in a higher, you know, CO2 run. So that gives us a little hope that there is some generalization potential, at least under you know, two times CO2, but we still have this big caveat that in many regions of the ocean, we don't do very well, especially when you have different type of interaction that is not just ocean, ocean, if you want, but could be ocean ice. So that's one of the caveats of this approach, right? Is that the data that you give it and the physics that the neural network will encounter will surely you know, determine how well you do under different uh, conditions. Now, the downside of this approach, in addition to, you know, maybe not generalizing all the time and being pretty opaque. So to avoid being that opaque, we tried a different approach. So now, rather than learning, you know, a, you know, a big neural network, which, as I said, has, you know, thousands of parameters, I'm trying to give it a lot of data, but now learn a symbolic expression for it. So how does it work? So now we're going to take data from a relatively idealized simulation, uh, mostly because, you know, it made our life a lot simpler. And we're going to construct a huge library of functions, all right? So we're going to take velocities, for example, and then we're going to construct a library of functions based on the velocities. And that's going to be gradients of velocity, squared of velocities, and so on and so forth, and higher orders. So we build about 200 functions based on the velocities, their derivatives, and their products. 
then we're going to use a sparse Bayesian algorithm. So what is that? Is that you basically give a library of function to the algorithm, and the algorithm is going to repeatedly prune this library of function to try to construct an expression that best, best matches the eddy subgrid forcing that we were looking for. So rather seems rather simple, almost you can think almost as you know, kind of hypothetically as something that looks like you know multi-linear regression, so to speak. It's a lot smarter than that, but you can think about it this way. So at the end of the day, what you will end up with is basically the sum of weights multiplying you know, a set of functions that are based on the velocities. And that set of function, again, is something that you pre-computed and that you give the algorithm. And so the algorithm is going to come up with different weights multiplying those basis function that defines our best to reproduce the diagnosed eddy subweight blocks. So we were pretty excited about this approach because it gave us something that is rather interpretable, right? And so this is the expression that came out. So I'm not going to explain the physics of it, but we spent a lot of time doing it. So it comes up with you know, the divergence of a flux, and that's something we imposed. We, we made sure that all the functions that we wrote could be written as the divergence of a flux because we're only trying to redistribute momentum, right? We don't, wanna, we don't want to have a net sink or source of momentum. We only want to redistribute it across scale. And then it depends on vorticity, shearing, and deformation, right? And now what's kind of nice about it, it's also symmetric, right? And so that is something we didn't impose. But what we did is we cheated a little bit, right? So you can see there is only one parameter here. It's one scalar. And initially, as mentioned, you end up with a lot of weights multiplying different functions. So here what we've done is because the weights that we're multiplying those terms that I showed you were very close to one another, we decided to just average it. And so we could write it rather elegantly with this kind of you know, symmetric stress tensor. We were able to relate it to the stress to the shearing and stretching deformation of the fluid parcel, which again, depending on the tilt of the eddies will actually flux momentum back into the mean or actually extract it. So this kind of expression is interpretable after the fact. You don't start by writing it down and, and you know, assuming that it works. We learn it from data and then we interpret it afterwards. So that's the pros and cons of each one, right? The CNN versus the equation discovery. And you know, at the end of the day, there is always the question of, well, if you implement those parameterization into climate model, would they do a good job, right? And so that's a big task. And so the first thing we did is rather than implementing them into a climate model, we took a very simple biotropic model. So it's a one layer ocean in a box and we tried it out, right? And it's pretty crude uh, and we learn in a given model and we're gonna implement it in another, right? So you can expect that everything will break and part of it breaks, but not all of it. So let's try to do that. So let's try uh, to take those S that we just learned from data and implement them into an idealized model, all right? So taking those subgrid eddies and sticking them into a simple model. So let me show you a couple of examples. So here I'm plotting the kinetic energy as a function of time. The gray line is a coarse resolution biotropic model, right? So one layer in a box, uh, you know, it's we blowing wind at the surface. So it creates some gyres and a jet. And this is the amount of kinetic energy that we have if the model is run at 30 kilometer resolution. So rather coarse, it gives you some eddies, but not a lot of them. If we run it at uh, 3.75 kilometers up here, you can see the high resolution in cyan. A lot more energetics, you know, the flow is stronger, more kinetic energy, and so on. Now, if we take the coarse resolution run and add, you know, one of the convolutional neural network that we tried, this is the violet line that you see. But here, what I've done is I tuned it down. Because the first thing that happened when we plugged it into the model, so the model didn't blow up, but it created the goal of the parameterization, right, is to enhance the inverse energy cascade, right? So to take energy from the small scale, and shove it into the large scale, right? So this idea of backscatter, which, which I introduced earlier, and that's really what we were after. So here, the inverse cascade was so good that we ended up with a gigantic eddy that took over the entire domain. So, so it was extremely powerful uh, doing the inverse energy cascade, except that it just didn't stop. It just took over the entire domain. And so completely wiped out the fact that the wind was you know, pumping energy into the flow all the energy going to the large scale was literally coming from the small scale parameterization that we introduced. So clearly not very desirable, right? So we had to tune it down, 
for it to do a good job. So still a tunable parameterization nonetheless, right? For the equation discovery, when we implemented it, then what we found was actually kind of interesting is now the model also blew up, but for a different reason, right? So before it didn't blow up, it was just crazy. Uh, now it did blow up over a few time step. And basically what happened, and that's something that we learned after the fact is we were building up way too much entropy at small scale. So we're basically developing a lot of grid scale nodes. So now we have a new strategy to try to filter that noise before we implement the parameterization and we're doing quite a good job. So I'm not gonna show you that here, this is just to give you an idea. So even though we can learn with great skill a parameterization from data, the implementation online, even in the simplest model, will require tuning, right? And it's also non-trivial on how to tune and where the issues might come from. And so learning from data, I, I do think there's a lot of potential to it, but there's still a lot of things in between that we need to think about. So just to tell you a little bit the lesson learned so far, and then I'll move on to where, where we are now, or at least part of where we are now, is we know there is skill in learning subgrid physics from data with ML. So I show you some example, you know, from our own work in, in ocean parameterization, but I also mentioned a lot of papers, you know, in the atmosphere that have done that and done that quite successfully. So there's a lot of exciting work, you know, on the atmospheric side as well, which started in the atmospheric side. What I call mix and match seems to work, meaning the parameterization are transferable. We learn from data generated by one, you know, model by one PDE if you want, and we implemented it in a different model. And it seems to work. And we have more example of that that I didn't show you. But tuning is necessary and that's not new, right? So anybody that works with climate models need, know that they, you need to tune parameterization. It's not insurmountable, right? But we still don't really know what we're tuning and how we tune it. So it's something to think about, right? And, and it might be because we are transferring from one scale to another. We're not very consistent in the way we're doing it. And we also did not really find something that was robust across different simulation and across different scale. And so we're still continuing to push on using complicated data sets and, you know, making the parameterization, you know, fancier and tunable. But we also thought that uh, sometimes it's good to take a step back, right? And remember what we're trying to learn is we're trying to learn physics, uh, not just something that is tunable and then hoping for the best. So we decided to take a step back and start with something that is kind of a simple test bed to explore more in depth, you know, both the methodologies and the implementation. And so I'm going to show you a few examples of this test bed. And it's quite simple. It's a simple QG model. Um, and I'll show you also how it helps us develop new methodologies, but also, you know, new metrics for evaluation and, you know, maybe inspire you to uh, play around with some of that as well, because everything is going to be put online in, in a matter of days. So again, I just want to kind of reiterate our goals, right? So anything we do is really to try to aid with physical mechanism and interpretation, right? So if I want to learn a new parameterization to put in a climate model, I still want to learn physics. And I still want to be able to, to say something about the physics of the oceans. Whatever method that I use, whether it's machine learning or anything or any other method you use, right? You always want to make sure that whatever you do is robust, right? If you were to slightly change the method, your answer is not going to be changed through it, right? And so, and your results won't be affected. And of course, we want to ensure, you know, that we have a proper set of validation, verification, and that we are well aware that there is uncertainty associated with any approximation that we come up, right? There is no perfect parameterization that does not exist. Uh, so this is a highly nonlinear mapping using data, right? Which is also imperfect. So we need to make sure that we, we, we are well aware of this and, and, and think about methodologies for it. So what we've done is we took a simple QG model. So it's written in Python, uh, was developed by some of our colleagues, Ryan Abernathy, Marta Jensen, and many others you know, over the years. It's completely available online, it's on GitHub. You can configure it you know, however you want in surface QG mode, two layer, multiple layers, and so on and so forth. Very simple. You can set it up in multiple configurations. So here I'm showing you two config, one that is an eddy configuration up top here and a jet config down here. Uh, and so basically all we've done is we changed beta uh, in the simulations and, you know, you can see basically eddies developing, you know, you can see some of them merging together, some of the large scale flow, you know, popping up in various places. So we're going to use this data as kind of our test bed with a lot of data sets, you know, that we can play with, learn parameterization, implement them and test them against 
some of the parameterization that have been developed from a more theoretical background, so to speak. So I'm going to rush through that a little bit and again, hopefully inspire you know, a few ideas. So first set of parameterization we tried was again a neural network, right? So same as before, we take output, in this case it's going to be potential vorticity because we're using QG, right? So, so we're using PV here. So we have a two layer model, by the way, I can't remember if I said that. So we're going to, in, we're going to take the input, uh, we're going to use, you know, again, a convolutional neural network. The model is doubly periodic, right? So, you know, that it has its own challenges, but again, not a big deal. Uh, and then we're gonna learn the subgrade forcing. So, you know, basically for, uh, you know, for this kind of simple eddy configuration. So I should mention, we only gonna learn from the eddy configuration over here, right? So where there are no jets at all, everything is, so it's on a beta plan, so it's not purely isotropic, but we have no uh, large scale jet structures. Second methods we're going to use is genetic programming. And so it's going back to this idea of learning a symbolic expression. So before I go through this kind of complicated, you know, uh, uh, diagram, when we learn a symbolic expression for, you know, our parameterization, we had to pre-compute a huge library of functions, right? So we had to make a decision ahead of time. This is going to be the library of functions that I want. I need to calculate it. And of course, the size of the library is limited by the memory uh, we have, by the way. So, and, and you need to pre-compute everything from scratch. So here, what genetic programming is doing is basically setting trees, right, in parallel, where you can have multiplication, divisions, and so on and so forth, and additions of different trees. And what's gonna, what it's gonna do is basically gonna take the data set and again, try to figure out what, is, what are the best matches, you know, across those trees. It will depend on, again, some kind of fitness, which is the accuracy and how parse the equation can be, right? But then you can play around, right? So you have multiple trees. And so, you know, for example, this blue tree is where, you know, the scale or the fitness, you know, will be very good. So what, what the algorithm is gonna do is gonna snip, you know, that piece, it's gonna keep only the part that is, you know, doing a good job. Uh, and then do the same across another tree where you have, say, for example, an addition or a subtraction of two different terms. And then gonna take that bit and then basically mutate. So combine the two of them together and create a new tree in which, again, you will be able to actually reconstruct the data with a set of you know, equations that best match the data that you have. But the difference here is you don't need to calculate all those, you know, basically multiplication and so on and so forth of, um, you know, of your data sets. Now, of course, it's still quite expensive by the way, but, but there's still pros and cons to it. So here mutation was one of them. You can do a lot of you know, other things. You can do you know, sub tree mutation where you don't need to have the full tree, but you only take a small piece of it. So again, there are many, you know, many fancy things to describe here. It's actually a lot of fun uh, to learn about that stuff. Now the downside of genetic programming is the majority of the algorithms that are out there can't really deal with our data because they're not used to spatial data sets. So what we did is we basically developed you know, uh, a small tweak to genetic programming that already exists in Python, and we made two changes. One, we introduced spatial derivatives, and a second one, and that's you know arguable, uh, is we uh, have an intervention that we call human in a loop, meaning that the algorithm, you know, because it does not pre-compute things by itself, and it's going to go down the tree and then decide on you know if an addition of say potential vorticity and velocity together makes sense, which for us we know it doesn't make sense; they don't have the same units. The algorithm does not know anything about this, right? So we basically kind of modify the algorithm so that we can intervene uh, to avoid this type of, you know, mismatch between, say, different terms that have completely different units, which physically makes no sense at all. But again, the big pro of this this approach is we don't need to pre-compute all the terms, so we can come up with terms that we didn't think about before, high order derivatives that we didn't have time to compute, or too expensive, or things that are a lot more non-local that we had before. And so what I'm going to do in the next few minutes, I'm going to show you a few results of, you know, what we ended up. So here's one expression, you know, coming out of the, of this kind of hybrid learning. Looks a little crazy, right? It's a lot of kind of, you know, Nabla two, four, six. It's, it's you know, very non-local uh, to some extent. So something that we will never implement in a real planet model, at least in the ocean part, since we were not in spectral space. But it shows you the kind of term that can come out. So basically kind of, an attraction uh, with different orders um, and so on. And we were able to interpret that actually. So there are P 
pieces of those parameterization that have been proposed in the literature in the past. So give you something that is interpretable, even though it might not be the most you know, trivial or both for implementation or for understanding. So let me show you a couple of results now. So first one, offline metrics, right? So we learn from data. Let's see if you know, we kept some of the data untouched that we didn't learn from, and then look at the scale. So there are a lot of plots here. I'm just gonna look at a few of them. So using a neural network, right? So a neural network to learn the subgrid parameterization in the upper layer, the correlation or the R squared, right, is, is really high. So you see 0.88 or you know, 0.94. So it's extremely high. And it's true if you look at the lower layer as well. Our new hybrid symbolic expression the offline scale is lower than the CNN, right? But it's still pretty high. Now, if we compare it to backscatter, so backscatter is um, basically parameterization that was proposed quite some years ago now with, by Malte Jensen and Isaac Helt, taking the energy being dissipated at small scale and re-injecting it as a negative viscosity at slightly larger scale, right? So, and it's energetically constrained, right? So it's basically only taking the energy that is being dissipated at small scale re-injecting it at large scale. Now, of course, if we were testing that offline, then backscatter would do quite poorly. And there are some reasons for it, but it's not to criticize backscatter, it's mostly to show you that if you learn something, or at least if you plot those correlation offline, it's not necessarily a great indicator of how they will perform online. And so that's what I'm gonna show you now. Now let's take those parameterization, whether we learned them or whether you know, they were proposed by other people, and let's plug them into a low resolution QG system. So this is the high resolution run, right? So it's just a snapshot of kinetic energy. That's the low resolution, less energetic, you know, less exciting. So of course, like less backscatter. Add this backscatter term, which is a negative viscosity, right? So again, the one that was proposed, hard to tell the difference, but it looks a little bit more energetic, right? The front might be a little bit sharper, the edges might be a bit sharper. Looks, looks a little bit more energetic just by eye. This is the CNN, kind of looks the same as well, right? And if we look at our hybrid symbolic expression, also looks pretty much the same. So by I, each one of them, even though had different scale offline, when we implement them in a coarse resolution simulation, they all seem to improve on the low resolution, but all equally, right? And so we can look at a few more metrics rather than just a snapshot by I. Here's the total kinetic energy. So let me actually put them all up. So let's, let's look at the one in the middle here. So uh, time, kinetic energy on the y-axis. So the high resolution run is the black curve. The low resolution curve uh, is in gray. And then we can see that, for example, the neural network, uh, you know, energizes the flow quite quickly, right? There is not as much of a transient as the other. So it goes in, you know, uh, four speeds uh, right off the back. Uh, the hybrid symbolic expression that we learn is the orange one. So kind of, you know, tracks, you know, pretty well the total energy and comes up, you know, roughly along the same line. And the backscatter, which is this negative viscosity proposed quite some years ago, also does perform pretty well. If we look at a probability distribution of the upper layer PV, you know, low resolution is in gray, high resolution is in black. So it's just a probability distribution. What we can see is actually the neural net seems to be doing better than the you know, backscatter or the hybrid expression. So if we look at different terms in the energy budget, so let's just concentrate on the kinetic energy flux. So again, negative lobe at small scale, you know, larger lobe at, uh, at large scale. So this kind of, you know, backscatter effect of transferring energy from small to large scale, they all do relatively well, right? So I think barely any distinction between each one of them. So again, offline is not a, perfect metric for online or at least performance, but it have some slight differences. Now we can you know, come up with different metrics to properly analyze them. And I'm gonna skip that. It's still a lot of fun, but I'll skip that just in interest of time to make sure that uh, I get some question, hopefully. Now we learned things on a given configuration that was the eddy configuration, right? And I showed you that overall, all three parameterization, whether it's a physics baseline a CNN or a hybrid you know, learning expression, they all do relatively well. Now, what happens if I take those same parameterization and implement them still in the QG model, but in a jet configuration? So the one where we had strong you know, uh, jets um, as a function of latitude. So low resolution is here, and you can see clearly the difference between the two. 
This is if we implement the backscatter. There's some differences, but quite minor. If we implement the CNN, it does not look good, right? It looks like it energizes, you know, kind of the southern part of the flow, not so much, uh, you know, the higher latitude, so to speak, or the northern part of the flow. If we look at the hybrid symbolic expression, again, by eye, you could say it definitely does better, right? So it seems that, again, in this set of experiments, the neural network that was trained on a given set of data does not generalize very well. The backscatter that seemed to do a pretty good job, you know, overall in an eddy configuration does not do as well if um, the flow exhibits, you know, lots of jet structure. While the hybrid symbolic expression, again, only learn on the eddy configuration, seems to actually generalize a lot better than the CNN or the physics-based one. So of course, those are questions, right? So why is that? What is it that it's learning that the others are not learning or don't do as well? But that gives us, you know, doing those kind of experiments within one control set helps us tackle all those problems. So we started kind of, you know, looking at the budget term to be able to actually explain the behavior and why they do poorly in various places. So for example, the CNN seems to, again, basically push the energy up along all wave numbers. So this is the kinetic energy spectrum as a function of wave number, right? And that's actually something we saw also in a biotropic model. It seems to kind of push the energy all the way everywhere, all the way up. And so really kind of struggles uh, to have an arrest uh, of the cascade at a given scale. Uh, the hybrid one does seems to do well pretty much everywhere. The backscatter seems to dissipate a little bit too much at smaller scale in this kind of jet configuration. And we can see that in the energy budget as well. So it's kind of an interesting thing, right? It's that, you know, the and also almost kind of predictable is that the data set that you give the neural network will very much, you know, uh, uh, I guess, limit its ability to generalize. In some cases, we still generalized it very well, in other it didn't. For the, but for the generative programming algorithm and also all of our other experiments with symbolic regression, it seems to actually not overfit offline or at least not have a large R squared, but yet generalize a lot better and seems to capture different aspects of the physics much better than before. So it was a little bit of a roller coaster of you know, different methodologies and different data sets, but it's also because it's very much the beginning, right? So we, we're starting to use those you know, ideas and push them, you know, what can they do well, what can they do better? And the reason for that is, you know, parameterization will remain in demand for decades to come, right? So I, I think when I, this is not the end of needing parameterization, even though we have more computing power. So really being able to push, how can we use data sets and new algorithm to improve on parameterization, I think is a very, you know, um, important topic and something that we need to explore, um, again, both, the pros and the cons of, of these approaches. So what I showed you is that it is possible that machine learning can improve or, or, or be used you know, uh, to augment domain knowledge. So deep learning seems to be very high skill. Is it generalizable and transferable? So I put question marks, right? So you know, like a few months ago when I you know, show some of those results, then they look really well. And now that we're doing it in a different uh, data set, then it's not obvious that they transfer as well. So it's still question mark because that means we still need, we have a lot to understand what they do well and what they do poorly, but we're starting to have ideas. Um, is it interpretable? That's hard, right? There are some tools, but not the easiest thing to do. Uh, and they also don't learn physics to some extent. You also need to make sure that you embed some conservation laws and things like this, which we have done. Equation discovery or symbolic regression, however you see it called, it's pretty interpretable seems to be very generalizable, more than I've expected myself, even though I, I used to argue that it would be. And it's very flexible for implementation. So I didn't talk about this, but I'll talk about it, um, I think in a couple of weeks at the CESM workshop, um, because it's an equation. So we know how to discretize it and, and stick it in the model. So that's quite simple. Of course, there's also the aspect that, you know, we might be able to discover new physics or at least multi-scale interaction in that, you know, in that specific, you know, uh, setup. Now implementation, I showed you that tuning is needed, right? In some cases, not always, but it, it is needed. It's not that different than any other parameterization, but nonetheless, uh, we still don't exactly know how to tune and, and when to tune. So there's a lot to learn there. You know, Can we make it more scale aware, resolution aware, and, and learn something about those tuning parameters? And I still believe that you know, if we really want to push those ideas forward, we just need to make sure that we have the right training sets and the right benchmark 
So we can really go and try to understand the physics being, you know, captured by those machine learning closures. And that's something that, again, there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, and also, if we want to implement them in climate models, you know, would they improve the simulations at the end of the day? We don't know, right? It's a big question mark. I'll show some preliminary results, as I said, you know, in an idealized MOMC configuration of the CSM workshop. Uh, and again, I'll tell you a little bit of the pros and cons. But a lot of work, you know, is being done with many colleagues across many institutions uh, in a project funded uh, by Schmidt Futures, in which we are tackling, you know, the subway parameterization problems in the ocean, atmosphere, and sea ice um, with, with machine learning and data. So I leave it at that and uh, uh, looking forward to questions and discussions. So thanks again. Thank you, uh, Laura. I wish we had an uh, applause, uh, canned applause thing here because <laughs> these online things always end with a, with a thud. So uh, yeah, let's applaud. <laughs> so, um, okay. So a uh, question here from Judith Berner. Uh, in regard to the QG results, should we expect the neural network to capture uh, the statistics of the high resolution or also the locality of the vorticity features? In other words, how local is your mixed machine learning parameterization? Excellent question. Yeah, it's actually quite non-local. Um, and uh, we were able to analyze that. So basically we can look at the input, you know, at basically the feature maps of the neural nets and seeing what we call, you know, it's basically its field of view or its, or its impact. And so there is a fair bit of non-locality associated with, with the neural net, but it seems that it might not be as non-local as, uh, as we might want it, because it doesn't seem, again, to generalize as well to other conditions. So there is definitely a fair bit of non-locality um, in, again, in both the neural net and the symbolic expression, by the way, because you could see the high order uh, derivatives in the Laplacian. Okay, uh, let's see, uh, here's one from Dylan Dickerson. Uh, you mentioned that the genetic programming equation discovery came up with terms that wouldn't be feasible to calculate in a real ocean model. Do you have any ideas or methods to try to influence the, the discovery? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's always a little bit of uh, this kind of, you know, uh, dilemma. How much do you let the machine decide and how much should we interfere? Uh, to some extent, right? And so, you know, I'm always worried. I, I always feel like the machines are great, right? But I still feel like we have pretty good intuitions as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when we did the, the first method of the, you know, the pre-computing the library of function, so there we really are 100% deciding what we give the algorithm. And we did it with kind of, you know, basically the, you know, physics idea, right? We decided that we knew that the strain and the shear will be important. We knew vorticity will be important. We knew that the gradients uh, that we wanted to compute uh, needed to be feasibly implemented in a you know, finite difference type model. So we knew that the order of the derivative right, needed to be you know, up to um, you know, second order or something like this. So, so it's easily implemented. But for the genetic programming, then there it's harder because it really goes after anything and down the trees. And that's why we've kind of, you know, have this kind of human in the loop intervention where we try to stop it. So the library of function has disadvantages because you need to pre-compute lots of things, but there you have 100% control over which, you know, pieces you put in. Genetic algorithm, it doesn't, which means it can be more creative, right? You let it, but it can also do things that are impossible. Okay, uh, we have another question. Yes, uh, from Chris Snyder. Uh, you showed evaluations of the parameterizations for the integrated, uh, quote, climate statistics from the solutions. Have you looked at how well the learned parameterizations do for prediction of high res model trajectories? Um, okay, that's an excellent question. So we did in a QG run. Um, so we have one of the metrics that we call the decorrelation timescale. So what we do is we initialize, you know, basically in the, we did that in the QG run because the beauty of the QG system is you can run hundreds of simulations <laughs> at no cost, uh, pretty much. Uh, we could not do that at the, at the lower resolution. So that's an excellent question. So some parameterization that do quite well on the climate statistics do very poorly at actually capturing the short time scale prediction, if you want, of the trajectories and vice versa. So 
we don't necessarily see those two metrics being highly correlated. Some parameterization might do extremely well online at the statistics, but very poorly at the short-term forecast and vice versa. Yeah, great question. Okay, yeah, I think, uh, let's see, I don't know if there's any more questions here. Um, so, uh, you know, in the, uh, the examples are the, or actually the actual physical problem has a lot to do with the 2D turbulence. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the prospects for doing this for 3D turbulence? Yeah, uh, good question. So, I mean, of course, for us, you know, at the end of the day, we are, you know, focusing on the quasi 2D problem, mostly because the scale at which a lot of the energy being transferred to larger scale is, you know, this kind of, again, backscatter approach. For the 3D problem, possible right now, the question, of course, is we need good models to be able to actually, you know, uh, do dissipation well, <laughs> right? Uh, because that's where, right, the, the, the hard part of the 3D problem is where dissipate, it's where dissipation comes into play. Mm -hmm. And so that, that always worries me a little bit, right? So we would need really good, you know, direct numerical simulation in which you can, you can diagnose, you know, properly the terms. And then of course, being able to cause grain it to a scale at which we can implement that into a model. Now I'm sure that for you know regional problem or maybe for the atmosphere, they you know there might be some hope in focusing on you know kind of good DNS simulation to try to uh, to try to learn something. But I know some you know I know several groups who are thinking about at least the vertical mixing part for sure. But that's hard. Yeah, so <laughs> Dissipation people, is hard. People are thinking yeah. about this, but uh, not. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it's a question of Reynolds number. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Reynolds number and also, I mean, also, I mean, again, for the ocean and I'm sure also for the atmosphere, right, you also think about the rough boundaries uh, that will play a role, right? So, you know, how much of that is important? Uh, but yeah, it's a great question. So uh, uh, another question here from Judith Berner. If you were to do equation discovery in the atmosphere, for example, systematic <laughs> underestimation of vertical extent of deep convection, would you use the same set of field terms or go to some sort of vertical structure functions? Good or question. Or yeah, uh, brilliant question. Definitely would not use the same functions I showed you. We only look at lateral fluxes, right? And then infer kind of the vertical ones because you know the ocean is mostly adiabatic. No, definitely try to embed. I mean, I would probably look at, you know, basically W prime, V prime, uh, you know, structures. And yeah, either yeah, structure functions or UFs. I think there are you know multiple ones that one can think of. But yeah, I would definitely not use the one I used. That's for sure. <laughs> so uh, we're almost at the end. I, well, I have one uh, small question about one of your earlier uh, slides. Uh, you showed the uh, the learning based on four regions uh, of the ocean, and you showed the, the parts to note the high latitudes that didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I noticed there was a patch off the western coast of North America. Nothing, yes. nothing particularly is going on over there that I know about that would. Yeah, that's that's a great <laughs> question. So yeah, so the first time we saw the plot, I also thought that there was a problem with it, um, and so we went back and actually what we were seeing is that there were, yeah, so there was nothing all that particular, but there seemed to be in the data set a, little, a lot of upwelling. In that, you know, in the particular, you know, region in, in that set of run that we used. And it seems to completely, you know, miss that because we're only using, again, part of the ocean in one region where it was not seeing that as well. So, yeah, that also kind of puzzled us as well. Okay. <laughs> we're wondering what was going on there. Right. Yeah. All righty. Well, well that is, are there, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank you again. I wish we had an applause uh, simulator here. It's all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks again, uh, Laura. And uh, thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye -bye.